friends, it's a proud privilege that the first talk of this annual technical meeting will be given by Professor Harry Madesia. Those of you who, who may not have the complete details of Professor Badesia, I thought that it is only act that I give you a brief biota of Professor Badesia, whom I know for a very, very long time. <laughs> Professor Badesia, a born to Indian parents in Kenya and moved to UK and did his master's in London Polytechnic, Metropolitan, London Metropolitan University. After doing his bachelor, he moved to University of Cambridge, did his master's and PhD, and continued to stay there doing research and become professor and fellow of Royal Society and fellow of Royal Society of Engineering. A very distinguished career punctuated by some very phenomenal work in a very traditional area, traditional area of steel. But in the steel itself, he has metamorphed steel into working on nanostructures, nanocarbide, and he was an intense force in the last 30 years in steel research. Joining debate, solving problems, but most importantly, not only solve fundamental problems, he also interfaced with the industry. The steels that are used to join the channel that connect England with the France, Harry was the responsible for developing some of those steel and looking at the feasibilities. We are very glad that he is here. I just wrote to him that will you be able to come to give a plenary lecture? He said, I have a class, but I can always reorganize. And so he is here. He is a great friend of India, a metallurgist. And I am sure we have many lessons to take from his talk. Harry. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chetapadi. I'm very grateful for the comments that you made, and thank you all for coming to listen to this uh, lecture. I'm going to begin by a small revision of the metallurgy of steels. Obviously, steel consists of uh, iron and carbon, and carbon is in the holes between the iron atoms in the iron lattice. And we all know that the solubility of carbon in ferrite is much smaller than the solubility of carbon in austenite. And we also know that the reason why steels are so wonderful as materials, you know, they've really met any of the challenges from any of the other materials. Uh, today, there's about 1.3 billion tons of steel being used every year. The reason, one of the reasons, is that we can produce an infinite variety of structures inside the steel. And I'll go into some of those structures today. But just to begin with, the carbon stays in the holes in the lattice. And today I want to show you a very recent discovery, which really is very surprising given that there has been so much research going on on steels over many decades of work. So these are the different kinds of phase transformations that we get in steels. Uh, you will see that I've categorized them into two parts. One is the reconstructive transformations here, in which the crystal structure is changed by breaking all the bonds and then rearranging the atoms in a particular uh, new pattern without causing a lot of strain. So those transformations are close to equilibrium. And then we have all the displacive phase transformations where you change the pattern in which the atoms are arranged by a homogeneous deformation of the crystal structure. Now, there's too many transformations here to talk about. The one that I'm going to focus on uh, produces a structure which looks like this. Look at the scale over here. It's a one micrometer. And the plates of ferrite here are about a quarter of a micrometer in thickness. 
So there is no thermomechanical processing which can produce a grain size of a quarter of a micrometer without any deformation. So this is produced simply by phase transformations and it consists of a composite of these very thin plates of phenytic ferrite separated by regions of carbon enriched retained austenite. And the fact that it's produced by a displacing mechanism is very clear because if you take a sample of austenite and you polish it completely flat and you allow it to transform into bainite, then you produce these deformations. These are the deformations which lead to the change in crystal structure. Now, the fundamental mechanism by which these plates of ferrite form can be summarized uh, in this very simple diagram, which is the consequence of almost 30 years of research. First of all, the plates form without any diffusion at all. That means they inherit the composition of the austenite. But at the temperatures where the bainite reaction happens, the carbon is able to rapidly evacuate this plate of ferrite and then precipitate as cementite. And if you want to stop the reaction at this point, then we add a certain amount of silicon to the steel because silicon doesn't dissolve in the cementite lattice, we end up with just that mixture of ferrite and austenite that I showed you earlier. This is the phase diagram, the classic phase diagram of iron and carbon. I've removed the cementite, and we are just looking at equilibrium between ferrite and austenite. And if I magnify this region of the phase diagram, you can see that the solubility of carbon in ferrite is incredibly low. Yeah? I want you to remember this number. The maximum solubility is about 0.02 weight percent. Very, very small solubility when ferrite is in contact with austenite. Later on, I'll show you a new phase diagram where you'll see that the solubility can be orders of magnitude larger in ferrite. Now, the story begins here. In 1981, I did some atom probe experiments where we can look at individual atoms and also analyze chemically what that atom is and measure the carbon concentration inside these plates. And we found that the concentration was far greater than given by equilibrium phase diagram. It's orders of magnitude greater. And we published these results without fully understanding why the solubility, why the carbon remains inside the ferrite. Because when we transform to bainite, we are holding at temperatures like 400 degrees centigrade for several hours. There's plenty of time for carbon to escape from the ferrite and go into the austenite, but it remains there. There's absolutely no error in this chemical analysis because it's time of flight mass spectroscopy, which means that we can analyze atom by atom and show that there is a large concentration. Now this is very hard to believe that you retain a large amount of carbon in the ferrite. Uh, when we published that paper, there were several others published by other groups using atom probes, which basically confirmed the results. And the explanation that we adopted in our 1981 paper was that the carbon is probably present at defects, such as dislocations because dislocations can trap carbon and what we are measuring is not the solubility of carbon in ferrite but the carbon that is trapped at dislocations. However, in 2002 the story began to change. Uh, we discovered that it was possible to form bainite in which the plates are just 20 to 40 nanometers thick. So this is the structure illustrated here. These plates are about 20 nanometers thick, finer than carbon nanotubes. So this is the world's first bulk nanostructured metal which is now manufactured in thousands of tons by Tata Steel. Okay? There's absolutely no deformation required. There's no severe plastic deformation. It's basically phase transformation at a temperature which is so low, 200 degrees centigrade, that the plates form extremely fine. But today my talk is not about the properties of this wonderful structure, but what we learned from it. Once this structure was discovered, many groups throughout the world started to apply the most advanced techniques to study the structure, and very soon papers started to be published about the chemical 
uh, constitution of these plates of ferrite. So these are the range of papers that emerged using the atom probe technique to measure chemical compositions inside those extremely fine plates which are finer than carbon nanotubes. Now, to summarize the papers, the concentration of carbon in that ferrite was again confirmed to be far greater than expected from the equilibrium phase diagram, in spite of the fact that carbon should not be there. Yeah? I mean, these samples have been held at 200 degrees for 10 days, and still the carbon is reluctant to move from that magnetic ferrite. So there's something fundamentally uh, wrong, unless we say that the carbon is trapped at dislocations. And there are plenty of dislocations in the structure to trap the carbon. Okay. The breakthrough in understanding came from the work of Francisca Caballero, who using one of the most advanced atom probe techniques at Oak Ridge National Laboratories, showed that yes, there is carbon at dislocations, but there is a huge amount of excess carbon in solid solution because you can look at the region between the defects and show that the carbon is supersaturated in the solid solution if we accept the traditional iron carbon phase diagram. So this caused me a lot of pain, this uh, paper, which showed that there is excess carbon in solid solution. How do we explain this? And after a great deal of, uh, uh, so these are just a summary of uh, results where you can see the concentrations of carbon that remain in ferrite far, far greater than anything you would expect from the equilibrium phase diagram, which is here, maximum solubility 0.028%. So against all expectations, we have a huge excess of carbon in the ferrite. Not only that, it stays there even though you heat treat the material. You hold the material for 10 days at 200 degrees centigrade, it does not want to move when it's in contact with austenite. And even the hardness is inverted. The ferrite becomes harder than the austenite, which has much higher carbon concentration. So there's something rather strange going on. Well, this uh, diagram I showed in my first slide, that carbon in ferrite is in octahedral interstices, just like it is in austenite. However, this octahedral interstice in ferrite is not a regular octahedral. The vertical axis there is smaller than the two horizontal axes. In other words, there is a tetragonal strain caused by the presence of carbon in ferrite, whereas there is an isotropic strain caused by carbon in austenite. And that is why carbon hardens ferrite so much. Its strain is asymmetrical. So I got to thinking and I said, look, we are calculating the equilibrium between cubic ferrite and cubic austenite. Supposing that the ferrite was tetragonal, you know, there was some ordering of the carbon atom, then how does the iron carbon phase diagram change? So, why should the fer ferrite be tetragonal? Um, almost every paper that has been published will analyze the X-ray data on bainitic ferrite using a cubic lattice. That's exactly what we ourselves have done for many, many years. Well, imagine that you have two cells of austenite next to each other. So these are just two cells of austenite. Inside that, I've identified some of the atoms as red. And those atoms form a body-centered tetragonal unit cell of austenite. Here it is. And this is, of course, what Bain discovered in 1924, that if I now compress that body-centered tetragonal cell along the z-axis and expand it uniformly along the other two axes, then I have my cubic lattice of ferrite. So this is called the Bain strain. Now, carbon atoms which are present in the austenite, there's only one carbon, uh, one octahedral interstice per ion atom in austenite. But there are three octahedral interstices per ion atom in ferrite. So all the carbon atoms that are present in the austenite will end up in just one set 
of our cathedral injustices in the ferrite. So if we have a displacement transformation, carbon will always end up along one set of cube edges, making the lattice tetragonal. Whether or not it wants to be tetragonal, it is forced to be tetragonal. Okay? So basically, when we do the vein straight, the carbon atoms will all end up along the z-axis of that cell. So when a displacement transformation happens, you will necessarily get a tetragonal lattice when carbon is present. Of course, very soon afterwards, the carbon atoms could disorder, precipitate, etc., and end up with a cubic lattice. So a diffusionless transformation will necessarily lead to a body-centered tetragonal ferrite. How do we address the problem of solubility of carbon in a tetragonal cell? Well, we can do first principles calculation. So first principles calculation means you throw a lot of atoms into a computer, do electron theory type minimization of energy, and you work out, for example, here the formation energy as a function of the lattice parameter, and you find the conditions which give you the lowest energy. So we did these calculations, and we put the data then into phase diagram calculation methods, and we had an astonishing result that look, if I have equilibrium between tetragonal ferrite and austenite, then the solubility of carbon in the ferrite increases dramatically. Compare this with the conventional phase diagram and the new phase diagram here, we have a very large solubility of carbon. So it doesn't ma matter how long I hold this material at temperature for a long time, the carbon will remain in the ferrite. Okay, so, we had a tough time to publish this paper. Okay? We had four sets of referees, twice. Okay? But we published it. And then we decided we need to do a, a measurement of the tetragonality of ferrite. So we took our nanostructured bainite and we put it into a synchrotron, which is basically a very high energy X-ray equipment. And we did an experiment in which we start from room temperature and then we heat up at a constant rate and we follow the change in structure as it happens. So the advantage of doing this is that while we are heating, we should force the carbon out of solid solution, possibly as carbohydrate is. So if it is tetragonal to start with, it should be less tetragonal when we finish the experiment. And sure enough, we found exactly what we were looking for that if we analyze the data assuming a cubic lattice, then we get a much bigger error than if we analyze using a tetragonal or an orthoro slightly orthorhombic lattice. In other words, the Vainitic ferrite is, in fact, tetragonal when it first forms. And here you can see the C over A ratio as a function of time or temperature. So basically, after holding at 500 degrees centigrade, the carbon precipitation we end up with a cubic lattice. So we now have direct experimental evidence to show that we get the trigonal ferrite. Now again, we had quite a lot of trouble publishing this paper, but it got published, and then people started looking at their own data more carefully. And sure enough, now, when they reanalyze data assuming cubic ferrite, they find that they have tetragonality. And one, one of these examples I'll show you uh, now. Uh, supposing now we look at the equilibrium between tetragonal ferrite and cementite, again we find that the solubility of carbon in ferrite is increased with respect to cementite. So following our paper, people in Germany uh, at the Max Planck Institute looked at severely deformed perlite, you know, the sort of wires that we form for high-strength steels. Uh, they, they go into making very large bridges and so on, very, very strong, something like 3 gigapascal strength, but severely deformed. And what Max Planck uh, Institute did was they calculated the distribution of strain inside the ferrite because even after the drawing operation, there's a lot of strain locked inside the ferrite and they decided that the strain was tetragonal. And when they, when they measured the carbon concentration in the uh, perlitic ferrite, again they found that it is much higher than solubility would explain. 
and they proved that that is not simply because of deformation, but because the carbon is in solid solution, and the same result was confirmed using atom probe analysis. So, in the new phase diagram that we have proposed, tetragonal ferrite has orders of magnitude greater solubility of carbon. So what we have to do is we have to modify all our theory for, for example, for the tempering of margin size. Yeah? Where we assume that the equilibrium state is cubic ferrite, where it's not, in fact, it might be the tetragonal ferrite. We have to rethink our models for the creation of uh, mixtures of austenite and ferrite, where the ferrite is generated by displacing transformation, for example, in the trip steels that are very common these days. So we are now working on looking at all those huge quantities of data which have been published on trip steels to see whether uh, we can do better. And what I really would like to do is to create carbon-free tetragonal ferrite in order to check this equilibrium without the presence of carbon. Now, if you go back to work done in the 1940s by Russian scientists on the martensitic transformation in iron aluminum alloys, they were obtaining tetragonal martensite in the absence of carbon. So we are going to look at that system to see whether we can do further confirmation experiments. So I'll finish my story there. Uh, there are consequences on mechanical properties because if carbon remains in the ferrite and it is an intense strengthening element and therefore you will get uh, much higher hardness than you would expect if it was cubic ferrite and we proved that using nano indentation techniques. So if you thought that the story about steel is finished, you would be so wrong. Yeah. Here we are proposing a new phase diagram which involves a much greater solubility of carbon in ferrite than has been assumed for more than a hundred years. So I'm going to finish there and I hope that all the young people in the audience are very keen to go back to the laboratory and look at their old X-ray data. Normally, I thought that this session I will not take a, a questions, but maybe two questions I'll take. Uh, but let me see whether there is anybody in the back. <laughs> <laughs>